So uh, I don't know about you, but I'm most familiar of looking uh, at at Dan Gilmore's byline photo, <laughs> which I did for, for a couple of decades. Uh, he, uh, for the better part of two decades, was uh, writing for the San Jose Mercury News for SiliconValley.com. Uh, that's amongst dozens of other publications he's written for before and since. Uh, his most recent book is Media Active, uh, which uh, talks about how all of us uh, can become better consumers of media, better and smarter consumers of media, uh, and that continues to be uh, a mission that he's on in his uh, more recent work. He's currently at the Arizona State University uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and uh, uh, Communication, and uh, we're going to hear more about what he's doing and, and what he sees the future of, uh, of journalism and of us as media consumers. Let's have a big round of applause for Dan. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, this auto robot is pretty cool. <laughs> I gather they used to do the drawing while people were speaking. Of course, at that point, no one glanced at the speaker or heard a word of what they were saying. So I think this is a better approach. Uh, Forgive me, I'm a little bit hoarse. I'm coming off a cold and, uh, and then breathing the fine air in the Bay Area, uh, which uh, has been a challenge. So uh, you'll forgive that, I hope. Uh, I, I'm going to try to talk about a few things that are, I think, relevant to where we are today with media, uh, somewhere a bit about where we're going. I, I'm not nearly smart enough to tell you what is going to happen in media and journalism. Uh, every time I think I know something like that, it, I, I get surprised. So uh, let's be surprised together in future years, and hopefully in a good way. I'm, I wish I were confident that that's going to be the case. Um, since we're at the Long Now Foundation, I thought I would uh, do a long look backward first uh, at where we've been with media, how it got to where it is, and uh, you know, on the principle that knowing where we're going, it helps if you know where you are and how you got there. So I'm going to give you the briefest history of media <laughs> that you'll ever hear. Um, Going way back, uh, I, I'm uh, thinking that media in the form of something someone created and uh, that told a story and left it for someone else, uh, that that may have started with the cave drawings, uh, in this case in France millennia ago. Um, I think of it as sort of an you know, early beta, uh, 0 0.1. Uh, had, I lived here so long that I uh, put version numbers on everything, so forgive me. I'm in career 7.3, I think. Uh, maybe the scrolls, papyrus, the first instance of something like paper would be uh, the next, uh, a next area of media. And we're getting close to uh, shipping version of media with a thing that you recognize, it's, it's a book. And the thing about these books is that they were written by hand. Uh, they were Bibles written by people who literally did them one at a time. And here's another Bible, but something happened in a, to, to profoundly change the, their present and ours. And that's, of course, the Gutenberg Bible, the printing press, the meaning of the idea that we could do a one-to-many kind of thing and we could print stuff it was still uh, reverberating in our lives today. Perhaps the p using of media for political purposes and social would be a dot one kind of advance. And then moving swiftly ahead, we come to the telegraph. 
which had a pretty amazing change. Before the telegraph, the fastest that information could travel was as fast as a train could go or a horse could run. That was as fast as it was. Suddenly it was going at something close to the speed of light. And if you uh, have the time, I recommend a book by Tom Standage called The Victorian Internet, where he looks at the telegraph and shows what profound changes it caused throughout society and societies. And it changed everything from economics to warfare to all sorts of things. And it also led to journalism becoming more modern because correspondents were suddenly in the field reporting back to people uh, from uh, in almost instantly. I think the late 19th, early 20th century is the height of print in the sense that it was the most important medium of the time by far and had uh, such impact on society. Not as, not as powerful as more recent ones, but very, very powerful. Then the next big breakthrough, I think it deserves its own version number, is the radio broadcast. Suddenly, one to many at the speed of light. This was new and used for wonderful purposes, for bad purposes, uh, but another transformative uh, thing in how we had media. TV comes along. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it, but the, uh, I think the moon landing watched by a couple of billion people around the planet simultaneously was another one of those staggering change moments in how we got our information. Uh, the, the whole world pulling together. Anyone who's studied communications knows that top diagram. It's by Claude Shannon who invented information theory. Uh, and very clear and accurate portrayal of how information flowed in the 20th century for sure. Uh, things have changed then, but the 20th century media, late 20th century especially, was a manufacturing model where we make stuff and then put it in trucks and send it out. Distribution. Manufacturing distribution. If it was a broadcast, we'd make the program and send it out over the airwaves. More recently, cable and satellite. That was manufacturing distribution, and then this happens. And Claude Shannon, if he were doing that today, would have a better diagram than this, but it would still be confusing. Because we aren't sure we're getting better at it. And one of the really big differences that uh, I think people in journalism, the business I was in for so long, don't still quite get, uh, at least older ones, is that it's not the manufacturer-distribute model as it was. Now we make stuff, we still make stuff, but we put it somewhere online and other people come and get it. That's really different than distribution in the old style. And the distribution piece of it is letting people know it's there, essentially, or having them find it. That's, that's quite different than what I was used to. So many things have happened because of it that I think are great and scary and all sorts of adjectives, but the thing I've spent a lot of my work on the last 20 years is the notion that the consumer is no longer just a consumer, but became a creator because the democratized tools were available to everyone and more so all the time. But these are inherently collaborative tools. So the creators are becoming collaborators for all of the great stuff that can happen and all of the terrible stuff that can happen. But that's a profound change, and that's our future in part, and so are things like this. I could do a hundred things this, but this is a thing called SafeCast. Uh, it's a combination of human intelligence, machine intelligence, sensor data, uh, measuring environmental things all put together by people working together uh, on a project that is, for me, quite interesting and about the future of media 
because it combines a lot and it's only going to get more so. This is in uh, northeast Honshu Island in Japan where they're measuring uh, radiation levels in the region near Fukushima, nuclear plants. And it's a project done by people in the communities, not by government. In fact, they did it because they didn't trust the government. And something important there about trust and how we can do a lot of these things ourselves. So as journalism has evolved, and, and I spent a lot of time in that early part of the internet age thinking about it and doing it, uh, you know, one thing we know is that the supply now is greater than ever, vast supply. We've, a few things that we need are going missing, which is scary, like local news uh, that we can have some reason to believe. But we're working on that, and there are things that, that tell me that we may get this right eventually. Vast, vast supply, but the lines are blurred from what they used to be. So I'll give you a couple of edge cases that we can agree on, that that's journalism. Now, it's not that the Post always is right. They screw up a lot, but they're basically doing journalism. And I think we could agree on that. There might be people in Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue who would challenge that, but I'm going to stick with that, that that's journalism. That's not. Uh, and you know, no comment on the, on, on the content here. Just It's not journalism. Whereas, again, best broadcast news in the world is the BBC, I think, at least certainly English language, and uh, clearly journalism, even though they're not perfect, that they are fabulously good, and this is not. Uh, I want to be really clear. I love the fact that people create media, and I love the fact that Nat and Foxy, some friend of Nat and Foxy's, uh, did a video of their bad dancing and put it up on YouTube. And that 50 people or so watched it. I think that's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. It's just not journalism. That's my only point. It gets blurrier in every way when we start thinking about what's happened in the last 20 years with people walking around with tools of media creation in their pockets. This young woman named Nita was shot and killed in the streets of Tehran a decade ago or maybe a little more, probably by a government sniper and someone walking by with a video camera that was uh, inside of his telephone took heartbreaking video of her death in the street. And this made its way around the world. Uh, in fact, it later won a very major journalism award, the video. But it was taken by someone who has never, was never a journalist before and hasn't been one since. It was a random act of journalism, <laughs> which we all can do. And increasingly, we should think about what, what we will do when we're in that position, when we can. Something happened when the, uh, the bridge in Minneapolis fell, the interstate bridge. Something fascinating happened. Normally people, when there's some you know, loud explosion and things crashing, they run away. People were running toward it with their phones to take pictures. That's interesting. And we have the ability to witness now in ways that have been changing. And of course, the most photographed event probably in history, the tsunami that hit Japan after the uh, 2011 earthquake which in turn led to the meltdown at Fukushima. Uh, again, people who are not journalists doing acts of journalism. Part of what's going on in journalism is that there's a low barrier to entry economically. You don't need a lot of money to start something. It, it can help if you have a lot of money, but it doesn't absolutely, uh, it's not absolutely necessary for certain things. So someone like Josh Marshall starts a blog a solo blog in, I think, about 2000, and has now turned it into a real, real journalism business with investors and profits and a terrific staff doing specific kind of work that is a must read if you follow politics. But it can be close to home, and it can be uh, for profit at 
and who knows if there's any profits at all with Berkeley side, but it's doing something that uh, local media are not, which is getting local. And we need more and more of these, and there's a lot happening, but it's the not-for-profit in, uh, in Singapore that's challenging the government censors and being media that they didn't have before. And I want to add a category. In the journalism ecosystem, I believe that the kinds of entities that are, are advocates, but honest advocates, are filling in a journalistic role that uh, we should recognize and be really happy about, whether we agree with what they're advocating for or not. So who does the best coverage of human rights in the world? It's not the New York Times or the BBC or anybody else. It's Human Rights Watch, period. Now they're advocates. They have a position, but they're uh, honest and they are very transparent about what they're doing. What's the best journalism going on today about civil liberties? Well, there's some good stuff coming out of the Washington Post and the New York Times and elsewhere, but I think the American Civil Liberties Union does the best journalism on the topic of civil liberties. Again, with a, with, with a very clear point of view and deep, detailed research and writing and reports. That, that's what's new and it belongs in the ecosystem. So I'm in the, when it comes to journals, I'm in the and camp. It's not one or the other, it's, a, we, it's additive. And we're finding incredibly wonderful and useful and important content that we never had before. If we think of it as part of an ecosystem. And I, this is a really bad stab at an ecosystem chart, but some of this in the context of what we're grappling with today, which we'll talk about a bit, uh, I think is, is close. I, I welcome corrections. Uh, so even though some really important things are going missing in journalism, and we, we could be in for some news deserts uh, around the country when it comes to local, and that's very bad. But people, again, are working on it. There's an enormous supply. I've been, in the last few years, worried about the demand more than anything else, partly because uh, people have been content to get their information in that fashion, and that there's so much of it, and so much is garbage, or worse as we've discovered in the last, uh, well, we haven't just discovered it, but it's become a national emergency or an international one in the last year. The, the notion of accuracy and trust are problematic in a world of Photoshop and tools like it, where images like that, uh, which is a composite race around the world, after events and some are just made up whole cloth uh, to pretend some things are happening. And uh, yes, it was debunked and uh, yes, it went, that went around too, but probably there are still people who saw that but who think it's real. Uh, we have ways of helping truth catch up with lies, uh, but that's not enough for all kinds of reasons. If you want to ask about that later, glad to do it. It's not just people with Photoshop in there classroom or basement or somewhere else. It's people at our best organizations who uh, profoundly screw up and uh, in some cases help get wars going. So we have a lot of work to do in traditional media. We need to improve the supply in every way, but uh, I still trust more than not. I, I've been thinking about what to call some of this and I, that title there, I've given it as the Disinformation Political Technical Industrial Complex, and it's a little bit too long for a tweet, but it, it, it feels like this is something we're, we're having to deal with now, and the, uh, the taxonomy here that uh, Dana Boyd and her folks at Data and Society did on uh, misinformation, disinformation, etc., is wonderful to look at and give you a lot of guides. The things that we're dealing with are really troubling. Uh, by the way, I don't like the expression fake news. 
Uh, I, I think we're stuck with it, but I don't like it for, for really two reasons. One is I, just, I hate the idea that you put fake next to news. Uh, that feels wrong. And the other is that people who lie all the time have taken it over and are using it against people who don't lie all the time. So I would prefer that we use words from the taxonomy and, and things like that. But it's really problematic. And it's worse when we're dealing with it in a context of uh, companies that do brilliantly what they do, but that what they do is used by bad actors in ways that the good actors are only just figuring out and trying to catch up with. We have a huge problem here. If you want to talk about this later on, I want to just say one thing about all of the calls I'm hearing for the platform companies to, uh, to become, you know, to, to, to root out bad stuff. Uh, that sounds really good. I worry about us getting what we want, if that's what we really want. And you can ask me about why later on. But be, let's be careful about getting what we want in this case. Need to point out, this is not new. Uh, if, you, if you walked by a supermarket checkout stand any time in the last 50 years, you've seen lots of misinformation. It sells brilliantly. It's incredibly profitable to sell lies not just for ideology, but for money. And about not quite a year ago, the CEO of CBS made that comment, which, if we don't do something, may well be the epitaph of journalism. We have to get the people who are in charge to care more about what they visibly don't. And the even worse news is that this is going to get a lot worse. Techniques are now uh, coming along to make it possible to create videos that show people doing things they didn't do and saying things that they didn't say. There's a great demonstration of this at the University of Washington, putting words in Obama's mouth, uh, and it's very persuasive, and it's just starting in how the, in the quality, an odd word in this situation, but uh, the, f the people who want to fake us out are going to be just reveling in the tools they have to do it with. Which makes me wonder if we are going to need something like Robert Heinlein wrote about in one of his science fiction books, uh, which was the notion of a human being as a, quote, fair witness. That that would be the answer in the long run. I, you know, maybe a journalist, uh, but the fair witnesses that he was talking about are a very different thing. That's again uh, off topic, but with, th there are technological possibilities we don't have time to get into, but using blockchain and other things, maybe of authenticating things like photos and videos and other uh, media that m might not have been possible in the past. Uh, I'm, again, I'm not smart enough to figure out how to fix the business model. I'm working in the area that people have called news literacy and some adjacent parts um, that related to media literacy, but basically uh, critical thinking is the, the heart of it. And I'll tell you more about that, but I, you know, some principles that are basic to both consuming and creating media, and we're all doing both all the time. Uh, and I don't like the word consumer, but I'm stuck with it, uh, like I think I'm probably stuck with fake news. Uh, and so the principles I work on and teach when I teach my course uh, for people who are uh, reading or watching, listening, et cetera, is being you know, just skeptical of absolutely everything, but not equally skeptical of everything. Use judgment. 
And, and I have in the back of my mind, when I look at media of various kinds and journalism, a kind of credibility scale. It's just, it just back there somewhere. And uh, so you can see that the BBC, which I obviously respect a lot, is more over there on the uh, positive side and not universally, but there, and you know, BuzzFeed's all over the place, YouTube all over the place, but moving more to the negative in terms of uh, information quality and anonymous comments way over on the left. The thing I want you to notice about this is that it doesn't start at zero. That anonymous commenter would have to, would have to work incredibly hard just to have no credibility at all. Something sucked credibility out of the atmosphere. It's like, you know, this monster thing going on. And a lot of what we're seeing now is yanking credibility from our ecosystem. But I hope you have something like that in mind, that you don't start with zero. You can start way, way in a deficit. And that it takes something to earn it. You have to do something to earn even no credibility. And that we have to ask questions when we're uh, doing any kind of reading where it's going to be something we care about, uh, whether it's to read something else on the same topic or as that's an email from a local official in my town where we live in, in Brisbane answering a question I had about a, a situation with the water in town. They, okay, I found out. Going outside of our comfort zones, crucial both uh, politically and culturally. We don't do that enough. We don't look for things that are outside of what we believe. And we don't get much help on this from Facebook. We need more help from them in going outside our comfort zones. And we have to be relentless with our own biases. There's a thing called confirmation bias where we tend to believe things. And if someone points out that we're wrong with facts, we tend to believe it even more. That's really t terrifying that that's true, but we, there are ways to work on it, and part of it is to recognize our biases. So we need to spend more time on these. And then finally, we need to learn the techniques of media, uh, how media are created. Uh, and by the way, every teenager is very good at that. Uh, and also, though, how media are used to persuade and manipulate. None of us is good enough at that. And remember, we're in a world where we're creating all the time, even if it's only through the act of sharing. That's an act of media creation that goes on a gazillion times per second. And it's shaping what we know as societies around the world. And we better recognize that we're creating in ways that we've never thought about. And that gets to this notion of the principles for people who are creating. I'm not talking about creating a bad video on, for YouTube. I'm talking about if you want people to trust you, you have certain principles to follow. And the first four of those would be kind of journalism 101. Uh, we don't do it on everything we do, but they're, they're useful principles. The one I'm adding for the 21st century is transparency, which is something journalists don't do typically, and I'm working on a project to help them do more of it. But I try to follow transparency principles in what I do. And when I uh, screwed up on Twitter a while back, I put a long thread about how I had screwed up what, what happened. And the basic thing was, I believe something bad about some people I don't like. That's dangerous. In fact, you should be, the more you want to believe something that you see that's flying by in your social feed, the more skeptical you should be about it. And especially skeptical if it's confirming something, if it's saying something bad about someone you don't like. In this case, it was the Daily Mail, which I consider the toxic waste dump of all journalism. <laughs> but I believed something about them that turned out not to be true, and I had to apologize to people because I, I got it wrong. Brian Stelter at CNN is doing wonderful work in this, trying to help his audience understand what's at stake here and to be more careful in what they do. 
I also want for us to work on what I'm thinking of as slow news, uh, related to slow food, uh, where we just take a breath, take our time. I wish journalists would do that, but they're not going to. I, I can tell you from experience that's not going to happen. There, there are some efforts to you know, hold things until they're right, but it's, we don't live in that world anymore, and we never really did. Uh, the, the getting a scoop and, and deadlines and all sorts of things conspire against journalistic uh, slow news. But we as the people who are uh, the, providing the demand for things could do better at it. And it takes all sorts of methods. A scientist friend of mine told me uh, that uh, when whenever he sees a report, whether it's uh, in print or broadcast or whatever, about some breakthrough in science or medicine, he puts it immediately and automatically into the following category. I think that interesting is true is probably the default category we should use for everything. It would, I think we'd get a lot better results. A lot of my work lately has been, can we make these, these principles and these ideas, can we make them scale? I think it's a good idea to do that, and I, so I'm working to try and make them scale. Who can do it? Well, teachers. Uh, we, we did a MOOC, a massive open online course, uh, but we, you know, realistically, the people who are teaching this stuff are not very many. Uh, critical thinking is not required in lots of classrooms around the country. California rejected a bill to make media literacy part of the curriculum in this session. Uh, they didn't exactly reject it, they just never quite got around to voting on it. Um, so maybe that's the same thing. Uh, so that's not gonna scale. And then, you know, let's face it, in parts of this country, teaching critical thinking would get the teacher fired as a dangerous radical. So, that's, that we can make it scale somewhere and some places that way. Who else? Well, what about the news media, which completely failed to make this part of their mission? Uh, part of what I'm working on now is to help them make it part of their mission. They still have scale and they can still do a lot, but let's get to where scale is if we want to, in this society, it's uh, the platforms. And they're starting to wake up and starting to think about doing this. They're making small steps. Uh, I wish they'd do more, but I want to see them help us be better at our demand side of the media supply and demand equation. And I, I think we're making some progress. In the last two weeks, uh, Facebook and several other funders have uh, helped uh, my university. I, I, I still live here in Bay Area. I go there once a month for a few days, and we're going to do a. Uh, we we started something we're calling the News Collab. It's a, as it sounds, a collaborative lab to do experiments working with people who want to make this kind of literacy and and uh, news awareness scale to higher levels. You, working with anybody who wants to play, and right now, our first project is going to be with the McClatchy uh, newspaper and web company in three of their cities to see if they can work better with the community to do this. And we have other projects in the works. But I think, you know, I'm not going to solve any of this, but we can make a dent, I hope. That's, that's a good goal. The other thing about where we are, and this is quite related to the earlier stuff, is the issue of control. And it's pretty crucial because we're seeing something going on that uh, has been going on really pretty much since the internet got going, despite the wonderful radical decentralization of technology and communications. Uh, it, every time things like this happen, people want to get control of it and re-centralize stuff. And the problem is that a lot of the decisions now that are being made about speech, about innovation, about assembly, about things we care about in a society based on liberty 
are being taken away from us. Uh, sometimes we're handing them over as part of our daily use of technology. We should recognize that, but there's a very strong recentralization into control and choke points that are quite dangerous to think about and to see what's happening. And this really comes down to who's going to decide. On net neutrality, who's going to decide what bits of information get to your device in what order, or in what order, at what speed, and whether they get there at all. I think it ought to be you who decides that, us. But the telecoms think that it should be them. And right now they're winning. And it, it's going to get ugly if they uh, do regain this kind of control and then assert it in ways that I think are likely. It, it won't be, I, I don't think they'll be that clumsy about it, but uh, give them time. <laughs> Who decides whether, remember the distribution is now being, being found, having people know where your stuff is. Well, uh, our friends at Google make very important tweaks to their search algorithm all the time, usually because they want to stifle spammers, sometimes for less uh, noble reasons, but things that are good get lost as a result. That's a lot of power in the hands of a single company, an awful lot of power. Talked about your f news feed. Well, you know, it's not yours. It's, it's the thing you see. But Facebook makes a lot of decisions. Uh, and uh, I think we have to really be demanding more of companies that have this kind of control. I'd like to see more antitrust enforcement. There's a lot of things I'd like to see, but we're, uh, we're, we're not fully confronting what's going on. Another control area is how do you get paid? Whatever you think of WikiLeaks, you should not be happy that a few years ago the major payment systems uh, shut them down for donations, just shut it down, probably at the request of the United States government. If you can't get paid for your work, it's going to be kind of hard to have dinner and have a place to live. And if they can do it to WikiLeaks, they can do it to anybody. That got very little attention. It should have gotten more. Governments are constantly helping corporate control freaks, and the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, is one of the clearest examples of that. But outright censorship is growing around the world and in places uh, including democracies. And it's getting dangerous, again, to be a journalist in much of the world. It's never been not dangerous in many places, but the danger is growing. Uh, just yesterday, uh, this woman who was primary reporter on the uh, Panama Papers was murdered probably because she had pissed off people in her society. We are in a really perilous time because even in countries where free press is enshrined, uh, our leaders are waging war against it, or at least a war of words, which uh, who knows where that's going to go. And then there's the, among a number of other things, the issue of surveillance, which is uh, directly related to journalism, not just because journalists will have trouble getting sources and keeping sources out of jail or themselves under a pervasive surveillance regime, but surveillance is really a deadening thing to societies in all kinds of ways. You know, not just journalists, this, is a, this deadens, it chills speech. It will chill almost everything. And we should all be thinking about how we can, uh, I think, how we can uh, not have pervasive surveillance, though our governments, plural, and corporations, plural, are doing their damnedest to make sure we don't get a choice. Uh, maybe we should be working harder ourselves to do things. Uh, this, by the way, that is part of the, the book I'm working on has to do with what we can do to regain some control. What I don't want to see is 
a world where we need permission. And that's what centralized control requires, is permission from other people. I don't want permission, in particular in the context of tonight, to publish or to speak. That's, that's wrong. That's bad. We have to prevent that. And I just want to say again that this incredible technology revolution, which I still believe is more good than bad by a long margin, uh, is not something that should be controlled at the center or by governments, but by us. That's hard to do, though easy to say. Uh, and I'm going to stop there and take questions uh, from all of you because I'm much more interested in knowing what you want to hear about. Uh, and but thank you for coming. That's how we. Finish. Thank you, Dan. And uh, we are going to take questions. Um, and Dan is also going to stick around afterwards, as we always do here. So um, definitely stick around. And I have a feeling we won't get to everybody's question, but uh, you'll be uh, around and available so we can keep this conversation going. Um, Rio uh, has the microphone. She's in the back. If you get her attention, she'll, uh, she'll get you the mic. Uh, also, to the folks on the live stream, thanks so much for, uh, for, for being there. And if you put things in chat, then we will, uh, we will get them asked. Um, let me ask you, Dan, um, to start off. You touched on it just a second before about getting informed about other viewpoints, exposing ourselves to other things, really dampening down the polarization, if I can put that word, is that, is that what you would say? And can you say another word about maybe, because it seems like that is, um, that in some ways readies things for these more nefarious elements that are, that are, are putting fake information out there for us, that the polarization uh, enables that, that, enables those biases. But, but what, do you agree with that or what are your thoughts on it? Um, I, there's no question that some bad people are uh, doing their best to make us uh, hate each other. I think that's part of the game. And uh, we have to, we have to first of all real, you know, recognize that we're being manipulated. Uh, and people are starting to pick up on that. We're starting to understand that better. Uh, but I have, I, I have a bunch of people I follow and read uh, because I know that my blood will boil when I read it. And, and I try to pick the ones who are honest. And there, you know, there are a lot of folks, I, I, this may be my bias speaking, but I think I, I, I see a lot more dishonesty on the right than on the left right now. But I probably could be, I could be persuaded that that's wrong, though I think it would be difficult. Uh, but I think it's important to, at the very least, know what people I disagree with are saying. I have to do that if I want to be able to carry on an, an intelligent conversation. Uh, and it's, you know, the other thing is I learn stuff from people who think I'm wrong. I learn more from people who think I'm wrong than people who think I'm right. This is a, I think, should be true of everybody. So. Uh, does that solve polarization? No, but it helps me a little bit be a better person, I think, and better and understand the world better. Uh, and we've got a question in the back. Make sure you hold the mic uh, up close as you're talking to it. Hi there. Hi. Uh, can you comment on the relationship between the values that you, you mentioned of transparency and non-anonymity for journalists, but then also the political privilege that that is to present news in a way where I mean, you can talk about who you are? Uh, if, I, if I fully understood, I mean, the, for the longest time, uh, well, actually it wasn't that long in, the, in a room where the long now is, uh, <laughs> for a really brief time in history, Incredibly brief now that I think about it. Uh, 
journalists pretended to something called objectivity, which is a really nice word, kind of like a unicorn. Um, doesn't exist in the real world, but it's, I, I don't know if any, we aspire to having unicorns, but we do aspire to something like objectivity in the journalism craft. And that's not, a, that's not altogether wrong. I mean, I want journalism by people who will look for as many facts and angles and, and things about the topic they're writing about as possible and, and present me with lots of nuance um, but even if they do that, they come from their own background. They bring bias to this and at some level. And the people, like, who, who they talk to is a form of selection, who they don't talk to, et cetera. So I just prefer transparency uh, in various forms when it comes to journalism to the, the uh, notion of objectivity, which I just don't think is real. I prefer people saying, well, here's, here's my something about me, my background. I think journalists could do more of that. I think they could say, if, if they have a bias about something, just say it and say, I'm working really hard to uh, overcome that, to present you with uh, as much as possible. But I love advocacy journalism, too, where people go specifically onto one side uh, and not that there are two sides to everything. In fact, there rarely are two sides. There are many, either, you know, there's many sides. Uh, but I think transparency would have the benefit of, in, in lots of ways, and I'll give you one specific example. Journalists have never been terribly keen about telling their audiences about the mistakes they make. Uh, and the, when they do, it's, it's usually, if it's a newspaper, it's on uh, page two days or weeks after the error appeared and no, really, no real context as to what, what happened. We could do a lot better than that. Uh, and by the way, and if it's on a TV program, you'll almost never hear a correction. So, as something, and one of the experiments I'm working on is a way to uh, do corrections that amplifies what you got wrong. This is an element of transparency. To, uh, I, we're going to do a tool that says to somebody who's read or watched, saying, if you, if you, uh, if you want, uh, and we will tell you when we've made a correction to something that you looked at on our, you know, our, our, in, in our place, and we'll present it to you in context, and we'll do it if, with email if you still use it, or we'll do it on Facebook or wherever it is you want to be told. This could have been done 15, 20 years ago. No one ever did it. So we're going to try it and see if it works. But there's all kinds of transparency, including, I think, a very fundamental one, which is tell people why, how you do what you do. The why is really important, but the how can be pretty good too. And you know, not no, not everyone. In fact, most people don't want to read a uh, you know the biography of a story. They want to, but there are ways to do it that, if, especially if you're going into uh, some very some deeper things. The uh, so BuzzFeed broke the story about the. Uh, former Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, you know, running around the world on private planes. And after they did the story, and they were, it was pretty great, they, they did a piece about how they, how they reported this, which was fascinating. They had people stationed at little airport fixed uh, uh, operator stations to look for tail numbers, of these private planes, and they, this was detective work. It was really fascinating. And I think that proved to anyone who had read it that they were, did relentless and good journalism. So that's, there are many ways to do transparency. Those are a couple. I wish we'd do more, we don't do any, or we don't do enough. 
All right, we've got another question there. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk tonight. Um, one, I wanted, I had two questions. Uh, one is to uh, take you up on your offer to ask about, be careful what, uh, if we get what we want out of these internet platforms. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that. And then number two is building on the transparency piece is, um, you know, media is increasingly not just a place of getting information, but a place of coordination, right? And collaboration, as you say. And it seems like I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about what, where the trends are going around collaboration and around building standards of trust. Uh, it seems the Times and the Post are increasing uh, their subscribership because people feel like there's some amount of trust there but that's still tradition, traditional platform. I'm wondering if you're seeing other sites around collaboration. There's all kinds of interesting work going on, uh, including news organizations working with each other. That's long overdue. Uh, it's happening now more and more. Um, but these tools, uh, you know, people, it, it took journalists a long time to realize that especially in major breaking news situations, one of their major competition, uh, one of the serious competitors was Wikipedia, which people would turn to because it, these stories would build themselves on breaking news. Now you had, you had to be careful, but something was going on that they hadn't understood and, and we're still not clear. I mean, Wikipedia is this, amazing phenomenon that I don't fully get. But collaboration's expanding uh, and, and I think is, is going to be a pretty standard practice over time. And I'm more excited about it when it's collaboration with the people in your community than when it's with another news organization. I think that's fabulous. And community can be geographic or of interest. Your first question, um, I, I'm cautious about We have no precedent for the size and reach and power of uh, at least two companies, Facebook and Google, which have an incredible say over how we understand the world and Facebook in particular with conversation. Uh, they, they, they're kind of the center of conversation. I'm very cautious about the idea of asking them to be the internet police. No, we don't want them to willingly let their platforms be used by uh, uh, the, the bad actors to uh, either commit fraud or uh, to uh, push, you know, push us apart or to do, do the really bad stuff we're seeing. But if we demand that they be the editors of the internet, we're going to regret that when they become the editors of the internet. And, uh, and that really scares me. So. And, and Dan, uh, on that point, with your new project, Facebook is, is part of the, the mix there, right? So you, yeah. you've said that you're... Yeah, this is an interesting th dilemma for me. It's not a dilemma. We, I, I, I'm comfortable with it, though I'm... There, I have friends who are not happy with what I've done. There is, I'm, there is one area where I agree with Facebook, and that is on the need to make news literacy and, and things like it more part of our public uh, policy and dialogue to help the, the users of media be, be more powered to, to do things for themselves. That's the one place that Facebook and I agree, and they, and they have, uh, I, I think it's, it's in their interest to make that more possible. And they are helping to fund this, uh, this lab that we're doing. On the other stuff, uh, on the idea of Facebook becoming the internet, which is clearly one of their goals, I'm totally opposed to that. I don't want, they've got more than enough power now. I want to see them, uh, you know, I, I think Facebook is a very great company and a, in some ways a very dangerous one. 
we have, but I, I, I will work with people I disagree with on everything else on things where we agree that I think are important enough. So this is one of those times. I hope uh, if, I, if, if that makes me a hypocrite, I will, I will live with it. I suppose what, um, what I'm most curious about is um, one might argue that they're already editors of the, not perhaps the internet, but of what you're consuming. And so given that the recommendation engine and, what, and the, um, you know, as, as we've all seen, the $100,000 in ad buy is small potatoes compared to the organic lift and the reach of what they serve you every day and the fact that they decide already algorithmically what you are going to see and what you are not going to see, whether that's your friend's baby pictures mm -hmm. or yeah. an article. So I, I guess what I'm a little bit confused about is um, as we think going forward about what we want to see from these platforms, recognizing that there's going to be a hearing, for example, on November 1st, what is it that you would ask them? And, okay. and what is it that, that you think that our elected officials have a responsibility to clarify uh, with them? Uh, things I have asked them for already and, the, uh, and that other people have asked that I agree with. I, I think they have to be much more forthcoming with data uh, for researchers to, uh, because if we want to know how misinformation is being spread, they have it. They have the data. It's, you know, it's, it's there. They need, I believe they should be more willing uh, and happy to work with people who can help uh, solve some of this. Uh, that's a big ask that I, I think they need to keep, people have to pressure them. I think they could give us, the users, more tools to determine what's in our own feeds. Uh, I would like to see them do that. I don't, uh, you know, they're, they're optimized for uh, engagement, for people do, doing stuff and talking and, and, and sharing. Uh, I, I'd like, I'd like a, a dashboard that would, uh, that would help. I would, I would like competition for Facebook. I don't think it's healthy when single companies dominate everything. I think that's dangerous. Uh, and uh, you know, at some point when, when there's uh, a reawakening to uh, antitrust, I would assume that this will become an issue again, though it's standard antitrust doctrine doesn't seem to fit with the situation that we're in. And it, it uh, well, it, it, I think there are possibilities, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic. But I, there are a lot of things I'd like to see them do, and I'm, uh, you know, we're, this is not gonna, it, when you ask companies like that to change the product, that's uh, difficult. We have a question from the live stream. Um, your thoughts on how to encourage media itself to embrace critical thinking as part of its mission and whether um, you see new partnerships with players looking at mission-based or impact investing, for instance. I would add to that um, the Marshall Project, for instance, is, is an example. I don't know if there are other examples like that of, of kind of mission-based yeah. news organizations. Any thoughts on that? Well, there's all kinds. I'm ProPublica, uh, though a little more broad. The Marshall Project, if you don't know it, is uh, a brilliant uh, nonprofit that is covering criminal justice, going deeper than pretty much anybody else uh, with with terrific journalists. Uh, uh, Bill Keller, former executive editor of the New York Times, is running it. Uh, it's, it's a terrific operation. There's a whole bunch of things. Here in the Bay Area, uh, the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, Reveal is a great news organization that's uh, operated somewhat in the shadows of others, but I think deserves more. There's all kinds of things bubbling up. Um, and some are not for profit, some are for profit. And, and by the way, some of the for profit journalism stuff that got funded like four and three and five years ago is going to hit a wall soon uh, because I think there has been a bit of a bubble in, in that too. Um, and I'll get those, uh, we'll, we'll tweet out those links uh, later and I'll get, get a kind of a list together with you. We're going to have one more question from the back. I've got. One more thing I want to ask you about the technological thing here. So um, your career has been through this 
remarkable technological evolution. And um, so I, I think for all of us to get kind of the benefit of what you've seen, obviously you can't predict the future and those earlier technological revolutions are not gonna, you know, are not a magic thing, but I wonder if you reflect on something as you've seen um, websites come out, blogging, and then social media become requisite for, uh, for journalists. Um, I imagine they weren't expecting the way that things would change, and as these latter waves of technology hit, maybe there were other expectations. I guess, what are your thoughts on how technology and media may be thinking they're pivoting now or, 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 or dealing through this? Are, is, is the CBS um, uh, head's uh, opinion about it's, it's all just business no matter what happens to the world, <laughs> is that... Uh, is that representative, or, or, or what, 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 uh, what wisdom can you share from, from seeing media through these years? I'll answer that last one first. It's entirely representative of television. Uh, look, CNN and the other news channels gave uh, Trump several billion, with a B, dollars worth of free, unedited, basically unlimited airtime in 2015, 2016. And there's one, well, two reasons, one small one and one, and one big one. The small one is that he was entertaining and people came and watched, which led to the big one. They made a ton of money. I don't see that changing. Uh, you know, we, we are in a market-driven society, and uh, I hope we will do better on other things, but I have no great hope that the TV news channels are going to do better than they've done. Uh, and there are spots where they do good things. It's not like it's all wretched. It's, there are these flashes of fine stuff here and there. Uh, God, I... I just don't know. I do. Know, all I can tell you is that the, uh, and I don't know how it's going to change journalism exactly, but too sweeping. Let, let's assume that the worst of the of the centralization does not happen or is somehow thwarted. And, but and that, but then, we, then we have something to worry about again, which is, uh, I mean, AI. I don't. I both. Am enthralled by and and worry about is it, it's the big imponderable for for journalism and pretty much everything we do, and simultaneously uh, uh, something that I and it's related is this uh, crazily named Internet of Things, which uh, if you look around is just sort of going gangbusters with as far as I can tell, absolutely no interest on the part of people deploying it about doing it safely. Uh, this is, uh, this is mind-boggling to me that we're heading that way, but when you add sensor and connectivity and brains and memory to everything that you touch, that's really interesting. And how that, that's gonna affect ev everything. But I don't, I can't tell you what the impact on journalism will be unless it's to uh, have, have a complete panopticon that w wouldn't, you know, in theory would be sort of everybody sees everybody at the same time. Uh, we've got a question from the back. Uh, you say that uh, there's more that's good in technology right now than, than bad or evil. Um, I'm, and I'm very curious about this. Uh, Jane McGonigal, the game theorist, uh, has recently popularized this idea of urgent optimism, not just in, with regards to journalism, but uh, in sort of the state of the world. We're kind of, A little louder, please. Uh, we're sort of in this uh, place of constant uh, disaster um, or crisis fatigue, um, but this idea of urgent optimism, um, I'm curious about what you, what gives you optimism, uh, projects or uh, things that are happening in journalism right now that give you reason for hope, uh, 
and optimism, and if you think gamification or games are involved in that, in that hope? Um, the things that give me hope are uh, both, both generic and specific. The, in gen generically, the, uh, that collaboration idea, I think, is still not fully tested, and we, we can, there's a lot more to come that is pretty exciting to me. Um, but specifically, I, I, I could rattle off a hundred projects that, that are intriguing to me that uh, I think present at, at many parts of the, uh, uh, for you tech folks, the journalism stack, whatever that means. Uh, there's a, in all places, uh, I see heartening things, albeit some very alarming losses in places we need. But we mentioned a couple there. ProPublica is doing spectacularly good journalism, and they're doing it in a way that uh, was unheard of 20 years ago, not just because it's uh, uh, online, but they, it's started out as a collaborative thing. They're doing things with uh, their, their, I don't like the word particularly audience, but the, the people who want to know what they find out, they're working with them uh, in ways that are not typical, including some crowdsourcing, uh, getting people in the community that they serve to help them do things. Uh, there's a, in, in related to that, there's a, a in uh, the Netherlands, a decorrespondent is a uh, completely reader-supported journalism site. No ads, they take positions, they are totally transparent, and they specifically and deeply involve their audience in what they're doing. They're about to launch next year uh, a site in the U.S. I recommend highly that you watch for that because I know those guys and they're really, they're really good. They, they have they have the right ideas and they're and they're they're putting they have an incredibly diverse and uh, in every way team of people working on it who are uh, helping to do something I think will make a, a difference there uh, I didn't even touch really on the too much I anyway, on on people doing using data to help us understand the world better and perhaps uh, make necessary changes. Data is always the two-edged sword, but it's uh, without it, journalism uh, would be in even worse shape than it is. Uh, and on and on. I mean, you know, I, I spend we're, right now this new lab we're doing. We're we're going to have a uh, we're, we're about to hire somebody to do a global survey of transparency and engagement. Uh, newsroom related transparency and, and community engagement uh, and and we'll publish it as we go it's a every time I turn around I find a better example than I had the day before so the the, the, the ferment in this sphere is pretty amazing and I I, I, I stay weirdly optimistic uh, at a time when it would be really, it would be quite easy to want to give up because there's so much that is wrong. Um, and to end on something also maybe hopefully hopeful, um, you mentioned your, your teaching at ASU as well as the speaking and the writing in this, this projects. Tell us something you're seeing or tell us something in the dialogue that you have with the students that you're talking to there that's, that's hopeful or that you see is uh, maybe yeah. part of the of so the future. My, my teaching is only online at, oh, okay. the, at this point. Um, that's how I ha can, that's how I can live here. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and I'll be, I'll be doing less of it as I work on these mm -hmm. projects. But I, something that's been making me feel a little better is that uh, when I talk to students in person, when I'm in Phoenix, uh, they're a lot better at being skeptical than they used to be. They're not quite good enough at being skeptical of their friends that, as they should be. 
uh, they're, they're skeptical of everything but their friends. They, they need to work on that part. But there, there's a, uh, there's, and there's this, uh, especially given the economic trends in traditional journalism, there's still a, there's, there's this amazing desire to do something journalistic in the world. Uh, and it doesn't, doesn't always mean that they're, they're getting pretty savvy. They know that a journalism degree is actually good for a number of career paths, one of which is journalism. Uh, I'm, I, I'm delighted when I hear about a student who goes and works for a uh, uh, advocacy organization or some other group that wants to deploy those talents. Uh, and I, I, I think younger people are uh, quite properly furious with our generation and uh, God help us if they don't fix it because they're going to have to because we've made a mess of so much of it. I'm not sure if we ended up with a hopeful thing there at the very end. But. They are but going it's, to fix it. But it's, they're going to fix it. They're going to fix it. All right, let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. Um, and, and Dan, as a small token of our thanks, this is a long now challenge coin. I want to thank you for, for being here. Dan's going to stick around. Please stick around. Ask more questions. I know there are a lot more questions in this room. Let's keep that conversation going. Thanks again for coming out and making this a great night. One more time for Dan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.